We'll now begin our next session of Fireside Chat with John Hennessy. Mr. Hennessy is an American computer scientist, academician, businessman, and chair of Alphabet, another parent company of Google. Professor Sang Yun Cha, Dean of the Graduate School of Data Science at Seoul National University, will be moderating this session. So, Dean Cha, whenever you're ready, sir. You know, it's an interesting question. We, we started with a brainstorming class of graduate students, and the simple question of microprocessors were becoming more and more important in the computing hierarchy, and they were, being co they were copying main frames and, and mini computers. Let's start with a clean sheet of paper and rethink, and that's how we, st we stumbled on the risk ideas from that viewpoint. So after we had done the work, we published the papers, I thought this is such an obvious great idea that everybody in industry is going to pick it up. And what happened was one day after another, the industry projects that were following on the work we had done got canceled. IBM canceled one, digital equipment canceled one. And finally, an early computer pioneer, Gordon Bell, came to me and said, you have to start a company because this technology is so disruptive, it obsoletes all the existing products. The only way it'll get out there is if you start a company. I was a happy ap academic, uh, but he convinced me that if I really believed in the technology, I had to do it. Oh, yeah. Well, I think Intel's got some challenges. They've clearly have, this is the first time in Intel's history they've fallen behind on the basic technology. They always, took great pride, good as anybody. When the Japanese semiconductor companies were the best, they were as good as them. When the Korean, they, they took great pride. And that was, that preserved the company and let it thrive even when they went through ups and downs in their system products and things. Now all of a sudden, they're not competitive on the basic technology. And that combined with the fact that they've never had a strong software uh, ecosystem inside the company. It's a place where chip designers wear the, wear the badges on their shirt of what chips they've worked on. And so I think, it, I think it's a very challenging time for them. They have to reinvent themselves. But it's possible. Look at Microsoft. Microsoft mm -hmm. reinvented itself in the last, uh, with, with their new CEO, and it's been, it's been quite dramatic mm -hmm. to see the company uh, rebuild on its core expertise and really reemerge as a strong player now. Well, we've, we've always had a symbiotic relationship dating back to Hewlett and Packard, which is now 75 years ago, the start of sort of the first uh, Stanford spin out. Um, we, but we, the university has always seen itself both as a talent magnet, but also it attracted people who were interested in possibly becoming entrepreneurs after they did their research. Because it was a very easy place. It was easy to take a leave of absence, license the technology and go, uh, and go do a startup, and then come back to the university and, and re-engage. And we've had a lot of faculty that did that. And when they came back to the university, they brought so much experience from starting a company and being an industry. They could give new insights to, and they could coach younger students who might be thinking they'd like to do that as well. So we built up role models. We tried to make it easy. Um, one of the great things about the Valley and Stanford or Berkeley for that matter, is that industry and university, they respect one another. They do different things and everybody understands that universities and industry are on different time scales and have different focal lengths. But they respect the work that goes on and that it makes it possible for them to collaborate and interact in important ways. Yeah, as I was, as I was thinking about uh, stepping down from the Stanford presidency, I started thinking, what do I want to do next? And I've been an educator all my life. Even when I was in a startup company, I was an educator. I was bringing in new young engineers and transmitting insights to them. So I, um, I became really dismayed about the quality of leadership around the world. And this was before what's happened in the United States, before what's happened in China, before the challenges 
some of the more recent challenges, the pandemic. Or, but already there were, there were real difficulties, right? The Arab Spring had failed. A Brexit was already afoot. The immigration crisis was occurring. Um, we, we could see lots of problems uh, in, around the world. So I, I took a look at some of the other leading scholarship programs and said, well, why not build a program that attracts the very best students to do their graduate study and helps them develop their leadership capabilities, their ability to work with others, to work in a diverse environment, uh, to communicate their ideas well. So we, we uh, attract students from around the world to apply to this program. Uh, we get about uh, 6,000 applications for 100 spots. Um, so oh, it's wow. highly competitive. Uh, but it's very international. We have, uh, with the, we just got our third class. We now have students from about 35 countries, roughly, um, around the world in every discipline. So we have people in business school, law school, medicine, engineering, PhDs, history, all learning together uh, and learning how to develop their leadership skills. Um, and so we hope to do some good in the world by investing in these young people. I think it, you know, it builds on top of your 10 virtues of leading matters. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think South Korea has many advantages. Boy, it's got an incredible talent base, um, and it's got incredible access to technology and existing companies which are really doing cutting-edge work. Um, it hasn't been, it's been more dominated by large companies than by entrepreneurial activities. Um, but that's something that could easily change. Um, you know, we, when I, when I came back from Stanford from my entrepreneurial adventures, uh, I concluded that we should help the students understand how to be the entrepreneurs. I went out and started a company. I did about the business side. I didn't know how to read a balance sheet. I didn't know what a gross margin was. I didn't know how big sales and marketing should be. And because of that, I made a lot of mistakes. And it worked anyway, that was lucky. But I concluded that we could teach the students the basics of how to build a startup company, how to make a pitch to venture capitalists, how to think about focus, how to think about how much money you needed and result in higher success rates for our companies. And that is indeed what's happened. So I think there are things like that that can be done to accelerate the entrepreneurial activity um, that could build on all the great universities and technology you have in South Korea. You know, when I think about how we, how we change the world, um, I'm a great believer that the world is going to be changed by the next generation. Um, those of us that are older created the climate change dilemma. <laughs> we created an environment in which a pandemic could break out and we couldn't really address it fast enough. Um, we need young people to step up and really try to grapple with these problems and build a better world for themselves and for their children. And that's going to be the, that's going to be why, that's, and that's why I'm optimistic about the future. I'm optimistic because every time I meet young people that are determined to make a change, I realize the energy and vitality and brilliance that they have. And that's what gives me hope going forward. Well, thank you. We are very grateful for you being with us uh, today and I look forward to having you physically in Korea once the pandemic is over. And uh, let's give a big hand to Professor John Hennessy for his... Uh... <laughs>